force uh, uh, known to humanity, which is the force of reason. So uh, unsurprisingly, Saul has over the decades garnered a large number of admirers and five of them uh, came together to decide to do this uh, collection of essays and this event in his honor. And uh, those five, uh, apart uh, from myself, of course, are uh, Atiya Varis, who is a professor at the University of Nairobi and also the UN independent expert on foreign debt. Uh, Martin Hearson, who uh, leads the work of international taxation at the International Center for Tax and Development. Um, Mustafa Indajivo, who is a commissioner of budget and planning uh, for Niger State and also uh, founded the African Center for Tax and Governance. And uh, we have, of course, Alex Cobham, who is the CEO of the Tax Justice Network. So uh, this is, uh, I would say, a genuine labor of love by uh, some of Saul's uh, admirers and his disciples. And uh, for this reason, we have uh, put together this uh, collection of essays, which will be launched as a special edition. And without further ado, to uh, provide more uh, insight into the uh, event's agenda and to give you an overview of the, uh, of the special edition itself, I will hand over to uh, the architect who has uh, put all of this together through her painstaking efforts of uh, coordinating a diverse uh, group of people, uh, Priska Musibi. Uh, so over to you, Priska. Thank you so much, Abdul. You are far too kind. <laughs> um, all right, and I thank you all for making time to be here with us today um, to honor um, Prof. Sol Picciotto. Um, my role, as Abdul has mentioned, will be to take us through our agenda for this afternoon and after say a few words about the special issue. So after um, my few remarks, I will invite Atia to share a few words um, regarding um, Prof. Saul's work and his impact on her life. Um, thereafter, we will have presentations um, by our authors who are here with us um, and one who unfortunately could not be here but did share her recording um, and they will take us through um, their papers. And uh, thereafter, we will have a question and answer session that will be moderated by Martin. So please feel free to use the question and answer feature at uh, the bottom of your screens to post any comments um, and questions that you may have. After that, the reason we are all here, our guest of honor, um, Prof. Saul, will uh, share a few reflection remarks and we will have a session uh, where we really just let you, the attendees, also share any words of appreciation that uh, you would have for him. I think it is really an honor to be able to do this when he is here with us. And so please uh, take advantage of this um, opportunity. Again, please make uh, use of the question and answer feature to do this. Finally, Alex will uh, come. Oh, yes. And, and that session will be moderated by Mustafa. And then finally, Alex will give the vote of thanks and the closing remarks. And we will call it a lovely afternoon. All right. So going towards the collection of essays, I will say that it has truly been such a humbling experience to work um, with the famous five, <laughs> as we so fondly christened them. Um, and and especially as I like to think of myself a toddler in this area of international taxation. I mean, how could I not, um, considering one of um, Prof. Saul's seminal works, um, the international business taxation has been with us for almost as long as I have been alive. So you can imagine. Um, I, I don't know if it's just me, but I think um, after international business taxation, we couldn't really hear Priska. It's uh, still on, I mean, it's still in. Yes. Oh, can't hear you, Priska. How about now? Yep. Okay, great. Works. <laughs> All right. Um, yes. So, um, oh, 
so I was saying this is our modest attempt to honor an academic titan who has really just been of profound impact to so many. Um, I think before I get started, I will say that we are extremely grateful um, for uh, the help of our assistant um, or our guest editors for this issue, um, Abdul uh, and Tatiana Falcao. Uh, without whom uh, this would not also be possible. And so this event and the collection of essays together are important for two reasons. The first is reflection. There's very many quotes on history, but a lot of them emphasize that without understanding where we have been, we cannot hope to get where we want to go. And some of us are at the initial stages of this journey that is the vast um, area of international taxation. Some of us are further along in the journey, yet some of us are at the tail end ready to pass on the baton to the next generation. But what rings true for all of us um, that are here and you know going on towards this journey is that Prof. Saul's work um, has been an invitation for us to reflect on our past and where we are at present and also reimagine what kind of future we can hope to have as we go ahead. The second reason this um, is important is gratitude. I think through the course of this project, looking at the diversity of the contributors from the authors to the guest editors, to the guest peer reviewers, to even those who really would have wanted to contribute, but for one reason or another were not able to, it really is just a testament to the inspiration that Prof. Saul has had uh, and continues to have. And I think it is um, also just an honor to be able to um, share our gratitude gratitude and be able to have Prof. Saul here with us as we do it. Um, and so the authors explore two main themes of um, Prof. Saul's work. The first is unitary taxation through global formulary apportionment, and the other is the internalization of the state. This is where the English. <laughs> um, yes, so we will start off uh, with Veronica Grondona, who will discuss how the theories of the state and its internalization provide a framework for discussions um, where matters international taxation are concerned. Thereafter, Malina Monde and Salma Nechesa will present uh, regarding unitary taxation within the context of Africa's extractive sector and Kenya's transfer pricing um, experience. Finally, we will hear from Prof, um, from Kerry, uh, who will conclude um, the discussions by giving us some insights on formulary apportionment within the extractive industry. We really look forward to an engaging and insightful session, and we thank you once again for joining us um, at this event to honor Prof Sol. Atia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's an absolute honor and uh, a pleasure to be here. And it's frankly very humbling to be, to be asked to do this. I, I know there are many uh, students around the world of Professor Picciotto, but also there are many people who probably know him a lot better than I do. So I'm very cognizant of, of how special this opportunity is for me. And my, my first engagement with uh, Professor Picciotto, which by the way, to date, I cannot call him Saul. It's a standing joke. I, it's not humanly possible for me. Um, the first interaction was his book on international business taxation when I was doing my master's. And three years later, I was looking to do my doctorate and he was in Nairobi and we, were, we got to meet. And his wife went for a bird watching and when she got back four hours later, we were still talking tax. I think it was the beginning of a, an incredible relationship and one that I really, truly value. At the book, the, the journal that's coming out has got the issues around unitary tax and formula apportionment. And I think that is probably the first issue that really struck me when I began engaging with, uh, with Saul's work. The fact that there is a lack of fairness, I think, in the system, and the fact that he pinpointed this lack of fairness is something that was so core to 
everything I'd studied in law, where you would be told, you know, law could be nonsense on stilts or law did not have to be just. And here was somebody saying, no, there needs to be fairness and justice, but not just in national systems, but in, in global systems as well. And so I, I began my doctorate and uh, it was a stab in the dark where his, his phrase was, human rights are wishy-washy. And I'm not convinced that there is a connection uh, between the two. And as a result, uh, let's see if you're going to survive the first year. And that was the beginning of my engagement on this issue. I'm happy to say I survived the first year and getting him to say, yes, there is a connection between human rights and taxation was probably more seminal for me than the defense of my proposal at the university. The connections between human rights and taxation and justice and fairness for me have been so critical to all the engagement I have in the fiscal space. And I have to say that he's been there every step of the way, holding my hand, guiding me and making sure that I understood issues. But at the same time, I was also very deliberate about sitting next to him at every opportunity and asking him not to ask me questions when I spoke at conferences because I was petrified about what he was going to ask me and whether it would destroy the entire thesis of my paper. This, is, this has been the engagement I've had with him over the years. And then that takes me to about 2010 after graduating. And we set up the BEPS monitoring group. We start having these very intense conversations about taxation. And frankly, half the time I thought my brain was going to explode because I couldn't keep up with the papers coming out of the OECD. And there was Saul producing these drafts over and over again with persistence, with determination, but also you know, with consistency on, on the different issues that were popping up. But his, his analytical skills were blowing me away every single time. And so I tried to hold on to his coattails and tried to keep up with him. And I think many of us in the room who have tried to keep up with him in those, in those reports will probably feel uh, very similarly. The, the size of the mind and the brain continues to amaze, uh, amaze me. And he, he said I should not be too, too effusive, so I'm going to now try and tone down a bit and talk about this inter interaction between human rights and, and taxation and the space that I now occupy is so special for me because it has led me um, through drafts of documents, through thinking about the legitimacy of fiscal systems, to his concept of fairness and the importance of making sure that the global system is a truly shared system for everybody. But uh, last year I made full professor and, and it, I made it having had conversations with Saul about what does it mean and how do I deal with it? And being the first professor of fiscal law on the, on the African continent and a woman to boot has meant that there have been so many obstacles and challenges and he's been there every step of the way. And so I think if there is one take home for me, it's that it's not just been about a, a journey on the context, on the content, on the understanding of taxation and the unpacking of different concepts, which we've had numerous conversations on over the years, but it is now also this uh, shared mentorship and guidance and friendship, which I, I truly value. I want to stop there and hand back over to Abdul, and I really look forward to uh, the discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Atia, for that uh, moving tribute and uh, that keynote address, uh, especially outlining the firm links between human rights and taxation. Um, now we will uh, continue with a discussion of the actual papers by the paper presenters, and I will uh, put it in Martin's. Uh, uh, firm hands to take us through that conversation. Over to you, Martin. Right. Thanks very much, uh, Abdul. Uh, and thanks, Atiyah, for those uh, very poignant words. Um, uh, so let me just quickly say what a pleasure it is for me to be here and part of this uh, meeting. Um, uh, Sol has been working with the ICTD since before I, I have. Um, uh, and when I started, I uh, inherited a program of work on international tax that he'd been the custodian of some, for some time. And uh, uh, the, the place we're in today in the work that we do is very much influenced by everything that Sol has done. And I uh, uh, and I really appreciate all of that. And I would say that um, 
uh, I still call on Sol as a peer reviewer quite often for working papers. And uh, I know that he's never going to give a paper an easy ride. So uh, I think it is uh, to the advantage uh, of the people who uh, submitted papers to this special issue that, that Sol was not one of the peer reviewers and they didn't have to go through that particular trial by fire. However, um, uh, he will have a chance to make his comments on the papers shortly. And so uh, brace yourselves, folks. <laughs> so we have three papers coming up. Um, uh, and it's quite a nice distribution because we have uh, three papers from three different parts of the world. Um, so we're going to have uh, Veronica Grandona from uh, Argentina who and who works with the, the ICRICT. Um, uh, and then we're going to have a paper from Kenya from Mal Melaine Amande and Salma Nechesa from the Kenya School of Law. Uh, and then we're going to go to Australia and we're going to have the video presentation from Kerry Siddique from Queensland University of Technology. So uh, let's go straight along to Veronica, who's going to present her paper first. Well, thank you very much um, for the invitation. Um, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm really honored to be part of this, of this panel, of this event. Uh, and I'm also very thankful to Saul for, um, for those uh, initial conversations that we had in, in 2014. When I didn't, I, I have to say and be honest on this, I had no idea of the work he had done in relation to state theories. It wasn't until recently that I knew about that. We were talking at the moment about international taxation and transfer pricing, which was the topic I was uh, researching into. So, um, so I'm, I come from, uh, I, I'm an economist, uh, so I, I, I sometimes feel, and this is one of those moments in, in which I'm stepping on the grounds of uh, lawyers on this or, or other theorists, <laughs> but I'm, I'm just going to go for it. And uh, because I, I, I was very pleased to find this connection, I was very surprised and, and loved, uh, I liked uh, this connection. And, and, and I'm sure uh, Saul will probably have a lot to say on, on my interpretation of this, but, um, but anyway, um, this is how I see it. So, um, so this, the theories of states, uh, uh, my, as, as I got into reading uh, uh, on the theories of state or state theories uh, and their relation to the internalization of the state and, um, and, and the way in which uh, also Saul interpreted in, in relation to international taxation. Um, well, of course, when we talk about this, we are talking about um, in also in the context of an internalization of capital. Uh, in internalization of financial movements, of trade, of um, economic activities which transcend the borders of the national state. Um, and in this context, um, states um, uh, compete among themselves, among each other, in, on, in order to attract this international capital. And this competition among states allows actually today um, companies, multinational companies belonging to multinational entities uh, to lower um, their corporate taxation in between two, uh, four or 8.5 um, uh, yeah, rates, to lower the rates in that, in that amount. So um, the amount and level of intra-firm um, trade has grown so much in the last years, it's actually not clear numbers, but some actually put it into an 80% of international trade being conducted among uh, firms. So the, the role of international corporations in this context is, is very relevant. Um, and this reproduction of, um, Today, what, what uh, we can see today is that the reproduction of capital requires or yeah, needs some sort of construction of a supranational legality and internalization of the state. Um, so there's been also an exponential growth of regulation of um, or regulatory networks uh, supranational levels, and this is pointed out throughout um, Paul Pichotto's work. Um, 
So uh, what does this mean um, that there's an exponential, we see it in an exponential growth of international treaties, for instance. We see it also in an increasing, the increasing role of technical organizations um, dominated by experts. Um, we see it also um, uh, in in the in in this um, in or, or or these technical organizations such as the OECD, the UN Tax Committee, the Platform of International Collaboration, the uh, but also the work of other regional organizations, um, ATF, um, CIAT in Latin America, also through the work of the South Center, actually, um, who is also hosting this meeting, um, is part of this um, of this this technical or organization or international organization or this attempts of international uh, of internationalization of the state of um, through technical bodies designing rules or contributing to the discussion with different power positions, of course, uh, and some uh, of them more or less influenced by the internationalized, internationalized capital. So um, the theories of state are then relevant to un for us uh, to understand the current discussion in, in international um, taxation, in my view. And um, so, um, so in in and, and why? Because as I said before, in this internalization of capital, there's more than one state involved. There's several state involved. There's an overlapping in taxing rights and gaps due to the creation of tax incentives and taxing and tax rules meant to attract mobile and global capital. Um, Albatter and and also Hirsch um, refer to the globe, to a world of a world system um, um, to counter and counter tendencies moving both for a unified international system as well as a fragmentation of the international system and 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 pointing out that this fragmentation um, is the one that has uh, won uh, this. This, this battle in a way, um, but uh, resulting in a, however, in a loss of national states as uh, elements of monopolistic uh, domination over territorial spaces, meaning that, however, states don't necessarily disappear, but that their mar margins of intervention are reduced. Um, Hirsch also talks about the liberalization of capital flows and, and products and services, and, um, and which places uh, national policies under the dynamics of multinational entities. And in this context, um, well, so I have to say, uh, started, or, or at, at least from what I read, um, had an important, a very important contribution to the discussion on, of, um, uh, the theories of state uh, back in 1978 already, um, and um, where he and and Holloway um, they they address this this problem of the of the theories of state, um, and in a, such in 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 such uh, intervention theories. Um, Marxist theories actually originally were asking themselves how is it that the domination of a class in capital society, society generates a sort of fantastic form of the state and impersonal apparatus of public power separate from society and in appearance separate from the process of production. That was the initial um, contribution. In the context of, um, of um, Holloway San Pichotto's um, intervention, though the this discussion is is taken to a world system, a system of, of jurisdictions interlocking in a in a system, in an also in a network, something that Hirsch also uh, pointed out. Um, so can how can we take these uh, to to international taxation? Well. Um, 
as I mentioned before, most countries, um, countries in one way or the other one, national states in one way or the other one, um, attempt to extending their the application of their tax legislation outside their territory. Uh, these, we see these um, in the application of implementation of world taxation systems, in the application of withholding taxes. We see this in, in some uh, very particular cases, which uh, because of the power position they are locating in, uh, have of course more success than others in um, in, 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 in implementing uh, their solutions, such as the US FATCA or the US guilty global low rate intangible income. Um, so, um, and, and also in countries supplying unilateral measures, um, such as those in relation to the sorting out the problems of the digitalization of the economy. Um, so all those are, are in, in a way, regulations of different countries exceeding that try to exceed their national borders, but are confronted with um, the rest of the national states. So here is where, as I mentioned before, the international organizations as ways of internationalization of the states also um, results as a way of sorting out these um, these um, obstacles of uh, of while ex encounter while extending attempting to extend the national um, sovereignty outside the borders. Um, and this has resulted in a, in a growth of international agreements uh, um, and uh, that we see also for exchange of information. Um, in a growth of some sort of public, private, and, and hybrid models of, of global uh, or internationalization of, uh, of, of the state, but which also can result in these hybrid models, like, for instance, Article 25 of, of uh, model tax conventions, both OECD and, and, uh, and United Nations, uh, with the mutual agreement procedures in it, um, can result in a sort of uh, private-public um, uh, intervention um, or entities. Um, so, just in order to, to sum up everything which I mentioned before, um, why is this relevant? Um, this relevant, well, one of the things I need to say also is uh, that is interesting is that um, so throughout all these years, Seoul has had uh, numerous proposals in order to sort out the problems of international taxation, the problems which, uh, and, and some of these solutions are going to be discussed later, such as unitary taxation. Unilater unilateral measures were also um, one of the things uh, analyzed by Sol, or encountering certain limitations because they would not completely sort out the, the, the problems of um, or provided by tax evasion in the international, uh, internationalization of capital. So um, among these solutions, those, there's um, uh, today's discussion of uh, a framework convention for international tax cooperation, for instance, which would actually uh, provide uh, an equitable or a, a level playing field for the North and South to discuss in the context of United Nations, something which is not possible in other frameworks. Um, but also, um, Another aspect, or or, or another, um, um, or yeah, a, another thing that can be said, um, which with which I would to conclude is that also civil society and internationalized uh, internationalized civil society uh, networking is also um, is also um, a way of uh, of participating in this. Um, world system uh, in which we have on one side international uh, internationalized capital and um, and the international or the attempts of international states to to regulate it so well with that I just I think I leave more open questions than any conclusions but uh, that's yeah what I wanted to contribute at this point thanks for listening.
Thanks very much, uh, Veronica. So let me say that uh, we're going to take questions at the end after the three. Um, so uh, so if you have a question uh, for any of the papers, please um, make a note of it. You can certainly type it in the Q&A section uh, function in Zoom, which has the advantage that we can share it with the panelists and give them a bit of time to think about it. Um, uh, but you can also just raise your hand when we come to the discussion time. Um, uh, let me just uh, pull the thing. So the next uh, presentation is by Meline Amande and Sal Manichessa, both of them at the Kenya School of Law. And I, uh, I didn't check your name pronunciation, so I apologize if I got them wrong. Perfectly well. Uh, my name is Malina Monde, a student at the Kenya School of Law. And I must say, I, I did shock a little in my seat when um, Priska mentioned that she's a toddler in the space. I couldn't then get um, a metric to define myself, nonetheless. <laughs> um, I, I, I do want to take this opportunity, of course, to um, uh, give a special mention to Prof. Faris, without whom we would, I personally would never have an, encountered a Prof. Soul's work. And with that, if you will allow me progress um, by way of introduction, really, um, we have uttered at least um, for the period that we have been here that there's been a current push um, for reforms in the international tax architecture, basically, which underscores the fact that the existing, uh, the existing framework is quite outdated, I'd say reeking of certain 20th century relics. Uh, that no longer serve um, the purpose for which they were formed. And of course, this is owing to the fact that there's been massive transformation um, in the global order, which then necessitates us to um, basically rethink how we view the world and its systems as well. And it's basically upon um, this backdrop that we, of course, reflected very heavily on Prof's work um, and expressed the need for a unitary taxation approach um, for transnational corporations basically to respond to that proliferating nature. Of course, I mean, I, I, I tend, to, or rather I was thinking to myself that at the inception of some of these tax norms and tax rules, um, they really did not preempt the extent to which businesses would um, become increasingly globalized and grow to the extent that they have presence in um, various jurisdictions. And as such, um, they then um, need to be rechecked over the years to ensure that they meet the current needs um, as is our reality. And I'd, I'd also love to say that Prof's role, of course, um, and contribution are currently being recognized um, and validated through, of course, the unified approach. And um, this also just basically advances um, um, our push in our EC towards um, a system that is focused more on taxing genuine economic activity rather than an ALP leading system. Um, however much we of course um, acknowledge the fact that it is um, flowed with a lot of political implications. And I mean, the, the, the various general difficulty in implementing the same and the fact that it, it's currently being um, facing a bit of backlash due to the fact that is uh, being perceived as quote unquote, upsetting the hegemony, I would say. Um, but nonetheless, our work is basically um, guided by three um, core attributes. And the first one I'd say would be um, the critical role that um, tax revenues do play um, in building nation states um, and, and of course helping states achieve um, their domestic resource mobilization commitments and ensuring that they then provide standard services for their citizens. And to this uh, end, we do strongly believe that tax systems then should be very effective to ensure that um, they enable states um, achieve their mandates. Apart from which, what we have been seeing currently is that um, nations are, I mean, being constantly trapped in this cyclic debt rat um, that is as a result of, of course, the budgetary shortfalls, which would have been covered by, you know, proper governance of revenues um, that would have been collected if there's any revenue collected, um, I'd say. And also, I think our work was also um, inspired by the fact that there's been a lot of drawbacks um, in using the ALP method in Africa's extractive sector that is constantly depriving um, African countries of much needed resources to um, finance the growing concerns. And very um, lastly, I'd say that um, there's this quote unquote 
legal fiction um, to the extent of its application that then warrants us to shift um, our minds on how we review um, taxation of transnational um, corporations. Um, I'm not so sure um, if the, the, the PowerPoint can go up because I can't really see it and there's some graphics that I wanted to allude to. Um, can you kindly confirm on that please? Marlene, let's just give it a minute while they uh, find the PowerPoint. Okay, sure thing. Thank oh, here you. it comes. Okay, great. That should be the second, um, the third slide. The, um, the third, third slide. Yes. So what I can see on um, my right of this particular side could be the left on your end, but basically we see um, this particular individual that's just asking themselves how, um, how they just want enough to buy themselves um, toilet paper. Um, but then we find that there's certain scrupulous individuals that are then stashing boatloads of money elsewhere, whilst other people just want the very their minimum to ensure their sustenance. And um, just to mention that, of course, the Pandora papers are, I mean, still freshly embedded in our minds. And um, I, I'd say there were, it, was, it was very critical in causing um, further attraction in the international plane as to why there's urgent need to reform the current um, tax architecture, which has certain loopholes that are being constantly um, exploited to the extent that they are um, entrenching um, in um, existent inequalities, which is inherently wrong. And um, at the heart of this expose basically was um, the nefarious action of certain um, wealthy individuals and uh, being brought to light and of course certain TNCs. Um, and it basically served to highlight some of the channels that are being utilized, which will be um, seen in the next slide. Um, yes, um, so the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists did um, a thorough job in trying to basically bring to light um, some of the avenues that were being exploited and to um, a distant right, we see um, some sort of an, um, an island per se, which basically um, symbolizes the tax events are being exploited due to the preferential tax regimes with you know very low or no corporate um, tax rates um, that are being exploited by these individuals um, at the tail. Um, and uh, to my right, uh, we also see that they also utilize very heavily um, complex financial structures um, in the form of shell companies that have very opaque ownership structures that um, otherwise um, um, basically hide the actual um, identity of these individuals and enabling them to um, evade taxes quite easily. Kindly do move to the next slide. Um, and of course, um, critical to this paper, of course, was the fact that over time, um, TNCs have also uh, found mechanisms to exploit the arm's length principle to engage in um, large scale tax um, avoidance, which is why um, uh, what we're trying to discuss in this paper, which has very devastating effects on um, developing countries by and large, which already have a dearth of resources. So it's very unfair um, to, to, to engage in such for them. And we specifically focused on um, the extractive sector in Africa, particularly because it's, it's a very niche industry um, to the continent, to the extent that we um, are very greatly endowed with, with um, certain minerals. Um, and what I tend to ask myself is whether there's, um, like the economic benefits are commensurate at the end of the day to our um, resource endowment. And half the time, the, the answer to that would be um, no. So what we are trying to do with the paper is just trying to understand what are some of the attributes that then lead to this um, incongruence in terms of economic benefits, whereas we are heavily um, um, resourced. Why then do we not keep um, the maximum benefits um, arising from 
um, our extractive sector. And um, for us, this was an issue. Um, so whereas we are heavily um, endowed with minerals, um, half the time, um, the sector in itself is quite capital intensive, which I mean, we have already um, uncovered that we are lacking to that extent. And so there's been a lot of over dependence on foreign direct investment from trans transnational entities, which is not inherently wrong at the face of it. Um, and um, just to, of course, bring to our attention, we, we really cannot talk about say gold mining in Ghana without first thinking about this new month. Uh, um, or we cannot talk about, say, oil in Nigeria without thinking about shale, or I mean, could be coal in South Africa without talking about Glencore, just to show you how much uh, of interference there has been um, with um, TNCs in that particular sector. Um, and of course, this is not wrong, this is perfectly fine. Um, However, what uh, we're trying to just highlight is that um, over the years, there's been massive capital flight in that particular sector. And Dr. Laila um, actually has a very informative um, documentary trying to uh, dub the true cost of gold, which basically tries to highlight some of this stuff. Um, and which of course, eventually end up um, leaving us um, the, the sector rather very vulnerable um, with regards to their revenue. Um, do kindly move um, to the next slide. Oh yes, so some of the vulnerabilities um, in this sector are basically as a result of one, the dominant position as I have established of TNCs with regards to their bargaining power. And at the end of the day, what we, we find is that there's a lot of quote unquote, exploitative clauses, which um, then establish um, corporate tax exemption regimes for these TNCs, which again, prescribe massive loss of revenue. And of course, there's also this contingency of unlimited sampling, which has been also a channel that is being exploited in the sector um, as, as, uh, as a means to smuggle out resources and eventually, um, uh, these countries are losing out on not only corporate tax, but also um, royalties at the end of the day. And of course, there's been a lot of exaggeration with regards to um, the expenses in intergroup trading within the subsidiaries that then lead to um, uh, deductions from their overall profits, which leaves us with very minimal um, taxable um, amount. And at the end of the day, of course, there's quite the dependence with regards to corporate income tax, which is prejudiced um, with regards to TP limitations um, to the extent that we over rely, of course, on this separate entity approach, which again is not wrong, but has this inadvertent um, um, outcome of misaligning profits with overall economic um, activity. Um, can you move to the next slide? So on this particular part of the presentation, we basically just want to highlight what is it about the arm's length principle that makes it a bit undesirable and why it is then um, that we want to, um, we argue of course, heavily dependent on Prof's work on the need to um, shift to, towards a more um, unitary, tax, uh, unitary method of taxing uh, transnational entities. And at the end of the day, um, this particular method is, um, it's, it's quite complex. And this whole idea of treating um, TNCs as separate instead of an isolated entity is in itself quite um, problematic. Uh, um, nonetheless, um, as, as we were trying to, of course, um, do a bit of research, we found that there's specific attributes about it that make it very difficult to deliver. Um, can you move to the next slide? And the first of which is um, the uh, conversation around indeterminacy. And the Kenyan case, we have a Kenyan case, which is quite classical um, down here, um, dubbed the Unilever case, uh, basically just highlighted uh, or rather shed light on the ambiguity and uncertainty that arises half the time with regards to interpretation and 
application of the arm's length principle, highlighting why in, it, it's very undesirable because in as much as we have um, this international guidelines that are very complex um, to, to basically implement whereas um, they're considered quote-unquote flexible and of course um, to move to the next slide. Marlene just to uh, say you're coming close to the end of your time now so yes, uh, yes. if you could wind up quickly please thank you. Sure thing sure thing and of course um, I, as I've mentioned um, it's it's a bit very complex um, in it, to the extent that um, there's manipulation of, of profits among different entities with within the TNCs um, uh, and the usage of transfer pricing mechanism that then um, makes it quite um, difficult to implement. Um, I think I'd, I'd, I'd sum it up here and allow Salma to take us through um, the next bit in a very brief period. Okay, Salma, if you can just take a couple of minutes to summarize the most important things from the rest of the presentation, that would be great, thank you. Okay, uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, please confirm. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Salman Echesa. We co-authored this paper with Manlin. Uh, basically, the next part of the presentation is the Kenyan experience, whereby we looked at the ALP approach in Kenya. Uh, how disadvantageous the ALP approach is to Kenya, whereby some TNCs uh, participate in transfer mispricing. We have a report from the Business Daily, which stated that 10 transnational corporations uh, uh, partook in transfer mispricing, which led to loss of revenue of 8 billion Kenya shillings. Uh, despite Kenya having a robust legal framework to combat uh, tax avoidance. Transnational corporations still uh, find ways, find loopholes to avoid taxes. So therefore, we are um, championing for a move towards unitary taxation, which Kenya and other countries in the international sphere can adopt so that the issue of tax avoidance is basically dealt with. We also looked at how we can smoothly transition towards a unitary taxation model, uh, whereby Sol, Professor Sol Pichotto's work uh, was uh, really, it helped us in this, whereby he stated that there are two ways that uh, countries can move towards a unitary taxation model. This is through uh, the tax administrators uh, asking transnational corporations to give them country by country reports, which will enable accountability and which will uh, help this tax administrators check that the transnational corporations are adhering to the set tax rules. And also the other method is the profit apportionment whereby uh, transnational corporations are to be taxed based on where they make profits uh, based on basically economic activity. Yes, um, the issue of uh, loss of revenue through mining, we, we looked at that issue and our recommendation was that countries can look at uh, how Indonesia has dealt with this issue of uh, revenue loss through mining uh, be, uh, because Indonesia ensures that local that uh, minerals are processed locally. This will uh, seek to curb the issue of uh, minerals being taken to other places to be processed and will curb this issue of uh, loss of revenue. Uh, yes, um, basically our paper just uh, seeks to tell countries that the unitary taxation model also has its disadvantages, yes, but it's a greater model and it'll help developing countries to grow. So because we um, depend on corporate income tax and if we are able to tax this transnational corporations accordingly, developing countries will really grow. Yes, thank you.
thank you very much uh, for that very interesting presentation. So we're going to pass to the last um, uh, the last presentation, which is a video uh, video presentation. A reminder that you can post uh, questions in the Q and A, um, and also that obviously, I think it would be interesting to post comments for Kerry, the last presentation. But as she's not here, she won't be able to answer any questions. Um, okay, so let's have the video for the last presentation. Good afternoon and greetings from Australia. The paper that I have written for this special issue is entitled Formal Reapportionment for the Extractives Industry, How Should Resource Rents Be Taxed? In honour of Professor Picciotto's work, this paper considers a move towards formal reapportionment in the extractives industry. Scholars such as Professor Picciotto have long advocated for formal reapportionment at a global level, while noting the difficulties that potentially arise in determining appropriate formal reapportionment allocation keys, as well as ensuring that countries of the global south are not net losers from its application. The same scholars also emphasise that while formal reapportionment at a global level is the gold standard, there are many benefits to a more gradual move towards formal reapportionment within the current international tax regime. Professor Picciotto has in several papers noted the exploitation of natural resources, especially extraction of minerals, oils and gas, as being key to the economic development of countries in the global south, with the main benefit being the tax revenue generated. Corporate income tax, however, is generally found to be disappointingly low, with resource rent taxes producing much higher tax revenues. This leads to two questions in the design of a regime that adequately captures the value of natural resources for source countries. The first is whether the extractives industry should be subject to a corporate income tax regime that adopts a formal reapportionment using the traditional three factor formula, or it should include a fourth resource rents factor. Second, the question arises as to the roles that separate but complementary charges can play. Both questions address the overarching issue of whether the corporate income tax regime should capture a greater proportion of income from the extractives industry or the income should be captured through alternative means. This article builds on the work of Professor Picciotto and others who have previously highlighted the tensions around the formal reapportionment regime for the extractives industry and in doing so focuses on source jurisdiction entitlement concerns in the global south. The extractives industry is one in which sizable rents generally arise, providing a potentially attractive tax base. Still, it is also an industry dominated by multinational entities, highly skilled in profit shifting arrangements that often face tax assessments by far less resourced revenue authorities in developing countries. Despite sizable rents, it is also generally accepted that countries rich in natural resources often fail to collect a fair share of tax revenue from the exploitation of those resources. Multinational entities in the extractives industry are able to minimise their tax contributions by shifting profits from the jurisdictions in which natural resources are mined. In practice, the arm's length price rule has provided quite ineffective at preventing profit shifting. In theory, it can be easier to find a comparable price in the extractives industry because of global trade of generic commodities. However, in practice, it has proved as easy for the extractive industry to shift profits as it has been for other industries. While the price of commodities may be known, extractive industry multinational entities have successfully found ways to adjust prices using complex bespoke contractual arrangements and adopted other techniques such as intergroup loans to shift profits. Before we delve into some possible alternative ways to tax the extractive industries, it is worth noting that both the extractives industry and the regulated financial services industry were deemed out of scope of pillar one. Given the extractives industry is excluded, there's an underlying assumption that the transfer pricing regime with its arm's length requirement is 
adequate, but many would suggest that is far from the case. Pillar 2 does capture the extractors industry. However, it is not a profit allocation rule, nor does it prevent transfer mispricing and aggressive tax planning. Ultimately, pillars one and two do not replace the traditional separate entity approach, but rather build on existing principles. Despite the lack of attention on taxing the extractives industry, proposals for international tax reform generally do recognise a justification for having a special fiscal regime for that industry based on location specific economic rents from non renewable resources. However, to date, there is no consensus on what industry specific reforms may look like. The difficulties of taxing the extractives industry have, however, been recognised. Perhaps the most notable contribution is found in the United Nations Handbook on Select Issues for the Taxation of the Extractive Industries in Developing Countries, a 2017 document. The UN devotes a chapter to transfer pricing and lists five separate problematic issues. Fragmentation of the supply chain, fragmentation of transactions, thin capitalization, intergroup charges, and taxpayers using offshore marketing companies to divide profits, arguing that they are securing demand through customer relationships, smart contracting, and high quality services, all of which are key to placing a product in the market and to overall value creation. Before we discuss a shift to formal reapportionment, it is worth noting that it is unclear whether a shift would have a notable impact on the revenues of countries with a significant presence of extractive industries. The very large profits of multinational in entities in the resource sector are the result of large and sometimes enormous gaps between the price they pay for the commodities they extract and the price they can command from their customers. The large profit attributable to their ability to buy commodities they extract for a value far below the selling price, commonly referred to as resource rents. A former reapportionment system might not greatly increase the portion of the resource rents allocated to the country hosting an extractive industry for tax purposes, however. Labor costs are a relatively low contributor to the costs given the high level of mechanization in the industry. Also, wages in developing economies exporting natural resources are low compared to those paid to personnel in other parts of the enterprise, such as the head office. Sales factor, a second factor in the standard formula, would yield no share of the profits for the extractive jurisdiction, as almost all, if not all, customers will be abroad. And then the third factor, capital, may have an impact given the high cost of specialised capital equipment, but the portion found in any one jurisdiction is unlikely to be significant. If we look at this standard three-factor formula, the greatest challenge for the extractive industry is the significant emphasis placed on the sales at destination. There are two obvious ways to address this issue. The first is either a differently weighted formula or a fourth factor that takes into account production volume, extraction, or a source-based sales factor. This fourth, fourth factor may measure business activity in the sector more accurately than the standard formula. The second is to use the standard formula for corporate income tax purposes with a greater emphasis on levies, recognising that such an approach allocates profits to the allocation of the sales, being the destination. Recent literature suggests that the extractives industry is recognised as requiring an alternative formula to the standard one, adopted due to the immobile and exhaustible natural resource assets that can generate substantial rents. To that extent, design options from existing regimes are offered and in the paper I discuss uh, Canada and also the US.
While a shift to former apportionment has been discussed, it has also been noted that corporate income taxes are often inadequate in taxing the true value to a country of its natural resources, with the regime becoming increasingly vulnerable to base erosion. These can be somewhat mitigated by jurisdictions through the use of charges beyond the corporate tax regime. However, it does require charges to adequately capture economic rents if a country wishes to effectively charge for the extraction of its natural resources. In fact, Professor Fukuyoto in 2013 argued that for the extractive industry in particular, corporate taxes must be supplemented by rent taxation using royalties and or a rent resource tax. The formulation of a government's tax policy for the extractive industry will be influenced by various features, such as location-specific rents, reflecting the fixed supply of non-renewable resources, the high risk reward for investors, the nature of the industry, meaning there are substantial capital outlays, and also commodity prices being cyclical. So these factors will affect a jurisdiction's decision in addition to putting in place a corporate income tax regime. Common fees and taxes for the extractives industry used by countries beyond a corporate income tax include bonuses, royalties, sliding royalties, resource rent tax, and state participation. Each of these charges is aimed at different government objectives. Fiscal regimes can obviously take several forms, including a combination of corporate income tax and royalties or contractual production sharing arrangements. But given the low amount of revenue generated from corporate income taxes, resource rich countries do commonly supplement their corporate income tax with a range of levies such as royalties and resource taxes which can be based on volume, revenue, or profits. Royalties, the most common means of imposing a levy on resources, are a production-based charge where payments are calculated according to the resources extracted, where a resource rent tax is akin to an additional income tax, which applies to a higher percentage of tax to windfall profits. Now, there are suggestions that rent taxes are superior to royalties, as the latter are distortionary whereas the former can be designed so as to not distort the choice made by investors. However, this will ultimately be a decision for governments. A decade ago, an OECD report pointed out that for resource-rich developing countries, the taxation of natural resources is possibly the single biggest make or break fiscal concern and noted that transfer pricing was a critical issue in the extractives industry, yet little reform has occurred. This article that I wrote in honour of Professor Picciotto discusses both corporate income tax reform and charges for economic rents. It does so on the basis that the extractives industry should be considered unique and subject to its own regime. Thank you. Okay, great. So let's um, let's move on to the Q and A session. Um, so, if you have a question that you would uh, like to ask any of the panelists um, or a comment, uh, we have a few minutes now to take take them. So um, I'll just pause for a moment um, and allow people to either raise their hands or type something in the chat. And I just remind you all that in the good spirit of uh, uh, Sol always being willing to offer a, uh, an insightful comment. Um, I'm looking forward to many of you uh, uh, raising your hands. I'm also going to ask a couple of questions myself. Um, so, once I've found them, here we go. So let me begin just by um, asking a question of the paper from Kenya. Um, I just wondered, um, I noticed in the paper, um, and you had to skip over it a bit in your presentation, you talked quite a bit about um, uh, about technocracy, and that's one of the aspects of um, 
of Saul's work that you were using. And I was wondering if you can tell us a bit about how you see that playing out specifically in Kenya, because we know that we often hear Kenya talked about as being a country in which there's particularly or relatively strong technical capacity inside the revenue authority. Um, so can you tell us a bit about uh, how you see uh, what we can learn from the Kenyan experience about um, the role of uh, technocracy in international tax? Um, okay, so um, I'll take on that. Well, I think there's a technical gap amongst the, the tax authorities that then pose an immense barrier, uh, owing to the fact that, of course, the area is extremely specialized and there's very specific, um, t uh, the specific type of knowledge required to then evaluate um, this particular transaction. What um, basically is um, at the heart of this is um, one, the lack of um, capacity to actually even go ahead with regards to assessing the, the transactions in terms of audit. Um, and also there's this whole um, conversation around um, a lack of comprehensive records for them to then ensure that there's comparability and benchmarking um, with, with other entities that I think would, would be the problem. I, I hope that answers the question. Thanks very much. Uh, great. Um, and let me ask a question to Veronica. I, I, I was wondering if you could, um, because you talk a bit uh, in the paper around the um, uh, how empowering countries in the, the global south can help counter the the uh, hegemonic block of the hegemonic capital from the north. And I was wondering um, how, how you see civil society networks fitting into the the story in terms of them being also a transnational net network, which may be. Um, doesn't rival the power of, of capital, but has its own ability to influence. Thank you, Martin, for the question. That was actually one of the things I, I kind of slided in the end, but I wanted to <laughs> maybe take the opportunity of, of uh, talking a bit more on that. And, and so thanks for the question. Yes, actually, uh, one of the things I mentioned in the papers is that um, in this context of internationalization of capital, there's a sort of internationally oriented uh, he hegemonic fractions uh, that are that have the capability of influencing states. Uh, so in this context, I think um, it is very important uh, for the countries of the global south the possibility of actually influencing the hegemonic um, discourse uh, at the OECD is nul. It's 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 actually there's no uh, actual possibility there. So um, in a way, the possibility of of participating in the UN um, uh, framework convention on on international tax uh, corporate taxation then then that's that's an, a practical approach that should be taken for de for developing countries or countries of the global south but the other one as you mentioned uh is civil society it's uh this is one of the things that is uh, i see also in in uh in Saul's work um in Sol Pichotto's work and uh mentioned and and uh also in his practical participation and and role in the in in all these years in in participating together with civil society in this discussion uh, I see actually civil society has uh, has had an absolute uh, influence in uh, in international tax discussions uh, in the last years, and we see it in small fragments of the civil society's proposals that come also from the research work and are in connection and not and when and, and they are particularly relevant actually when they are in connection with their research work by academics and uh and 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 with specific proposals and funded proposals or fundamented proposals um on 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 how uh on on alternative solutions to the problem and they have actually uh played a key role in the web action plan discussion with with a, a specific outcomes of it actually coming from civil society proposals and academia. Uh, and also in Pillar 1 and 2, actually, we see also in a way, even when the outcome of Pillar 1 and 2 is not what, um, what would have been most favorable for developing countries, 
uh, there is an influence there of the unitary taxation uh, conceptualization that Sol Pichotto has incorporated in, in all his papers through all these years. And, um, uh, and, 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 and there is an influence there, even when we don't, uh, when I particularly might not like the outcome of it, but, the, but we can say there's an influence there. Um, yeah, so so I think that uh, and and that's something this this uh, this um, hegemonic dispute actually um, can also um, uh, yeah it, it can be counterrested in a way by civil society participation even though well well the the the, the uh, absolute um, uh, yeah, hegemonic presence or, or influence of, of capital uh, and internationalized capital is, is definitely <laughs> difficult to counter rest, yeah. Right, thanks very much uh, for those reflections, Veronica. Um, very interesting. So we have a question that's come in from Helen Well. Um, ask it herself, otherwise I'll read it out. And maybe maybe she doesn't have the access to it actually. Okay, so um, I will ask it. Um, she says I have one question: whether you think domestic regional countervailing measures, domestic or regional countervailing measures, could be a more efficient than a global uniform solution. So I think that that paper that question could have a relevance to both of the papers. Mm -hmm. So yes, rather than a global uniform solution, is there a, is there a role for domestic or, or regional measures? So Veronica, if you want to take that, or uh, it can go to the Kenyan duo. Yeah, oh, I think I think uh, this is also, uh, as I mentioned, is addressed in in also in some of Seoul papers, and I also agree with that. That definitely um, there's uh, domestic uh, countervailing measures need to be introduced in a way, need to be thought of, and 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 unilateral measures, let's say, are uh, um, are a possibility, and countries should take hand of them. However, um, with the possibilities of the internationalized capital of, of moving uh, across regions and across countries and, and moving, um, uh, yeah, in, and, and, and taking advantage of the uh, sovereignty space actually left by some countries when they are introducing tax uh, incentives in order to attract capital, then uh, there's a need for a collaborative uh, solution uh, and that's where uh, regional uh, and and I think of course um, regional approaches like uh, the, the 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 very strong work of uh, of uh, the African Union and of ADAF uh, in particular in the international discussions uh, as a way of of presenting. Uh, uh, unified voice, even when countries might have a lot of differences among them, and, and the work that is starting to be done at the regional level also in, in Latin America with the fiscal platform uh, of Latin American and Caribbean countries, um, those are uh, also ways in which um, that can be used uh, in order to, to arrive uh, to a or to influence, to have more influence in the international cooperation discussion in, in spaces such as the United Nations uh, when it comes, but also it has proved to be influential and, and very relevant, the voice of, of the African countries united in uh, the OECD discussions themselves. So, yeah, so that's what I can contribute to this. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, do you, the Kenyan duo want to answer the question? If not, we have another question, so I can pass on to it. Okay, it seems like not. So um, I believe that uh, Atia has a uh, hand up. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... I, um, I mean, we're having a very technical conversation, but the thing that uh, is so important about Saul's work is that it's always bumping up against the politics of the spaces. And what I always find very interesting is 
we are researchers in a very technical space and then we're faced with its political pushbacks in, in different in different ways and i'm wondering whether any of the authors thought about the politics both nationally i suppose from a kenyan perspective for that paper but also in their papers at, at global and regional levels i think veronica's already sort of alluded to it but I'm also concerned about things like the gray listing and blacklisting of countries, the implementation of sanctions on countries. And what, what I'm starting to see more and more is that while we do the tax technical and we do the sharing of, of taxes across the world, what is going to start to happen, and I suppose this is for me the sort of forecasting future uh, direction I see is with this UN tax convention, for example, that we're going to be faced with a scenario where there will be countries that will still not be able to access finance anyway, uh, despite our best efforts on, on unitary taxation and formula apportionment. And I'm wondering if anyone's thought through that or has some thinking around it. Thank you. All right, very interesting. Um, Marlene and Salma, maybe you want to say something about the, the politics in Kenya? Um, okay, all right. Um, we we didn't quite think um on that particular issue, but I think it it's it's a guiding um light moving forward. And I think okay, um, just to allude to what Prof is saying with regards to um sanctions that would otherwise um then um limit certain states from accessing finances. I think um there's there's been a push at least to a regional level to have. Um, in terms of um, uh, uh, credit rating agencies that then allow us to have um, credibility from our own rankings um, and devoid from, of course, Western interference. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if this uh, speaks to these particular conversations, but um, as of now, that is what comes to the top of my head with, with, with regards to responding to that particular direction of thought. Um, okay, I think uh, to respond to Prof's question on the politics, um, during our research, we show uh, we saw sorry, we saw that there's an an equal bargaining power between developed and developing countries, which would make uh, developing countries to um, uh, quote unquote uh take up uh, treaties that do not benefit them so that they can still maintain the relationships or foster ties with uh, some certain countries, the developed countries. So I think that might uh, answer the question of the politics in play, yes, in my view. Thanks very much. Veronica, did you want to say anything on this subject? Yes, uh, thanks. Um... Though I, I'm also interested in listening to, to you if uh, I see other hands raised. But um, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I mentioned a bit of this, but uh, the underlying politics in this is, is very relevant. Of course, there is a pressure with this hegemonic view, also and hegemonic fractions uh, on, of, uh, that are behind the international capital. And, and there is a pressure for... Um, uh, national uh, states to to see see uh, there not to to leave away or to open gaps on, into their sovereignty uh, uh, in order to attract um, uh, attract capital. So that's that's a constant pressure and that play of politics of national politics into the national aspect and the regional one and the international one is happening all the time. That's why this is um, that's. That's why the relevance of regional bodies and and the in and and, uh, and and a space at an international framework is um, such as the United Nations, not any international framework of uh, is um, is particularly relevant. The other thing that uh, Atiyah was mentioning, and I, I uh, professor professor Atiyah was mentioning also, and and which I. I agree with also is that all these maybe does not solve the financial problems uh, and the underlying financial problems some developing countries have. Actually, I think, um, uh, for instance, um, uh, exchange of information and automatic exchange of information, in my opinion, is almost a revolutionary uh, um, uh, um, 
yeah, change in, in the international framework in terms of the amount of information that is exchanged and the possibilities that uh, uh, that brings to all countries. However, the least developed countries in uh, cannot uh, cannot uh, uh, accede that international cooperation uh, uh, because of cannot access it because of of the limitations in terms of financing and the national politics on many occasions, because you do have to, even when you sorted all the international cooperation, you do need to prioritize this at the national level. And, and that's where uh, you also have this other fight inside of the national states also. So that's why, again, the, the theories of state are relevant also in, 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 this, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this aspect too. Great, thank you very much. Um, we've just got a couple of minutes left. Uh, so Abdullah and Mustafa both had questions. Do you want to ask them together quickly and then we'll take our responses? Not, not at the same time, one after the other. Abdul first. <laughs> oh, well, Mustafa, you're there. It's fine. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So mine is not a question. It's just a comment, uh, two comments, actually. So one on the political economy. Um, I think um, there's been a growing consensus that, you know, the issue of tax, particularly international tax, is more political than that it's it's uh, it's technical. So and and, and I think um, it's very important that um, this is reflected in any of the works you know uh, that we do because it, it almost feels like you know the drag on the technical side of things. You know the arguments about the transfer pricing, uh, the the arms length principle is is more like a distraction from the main issues, the political issues that that you know that actually you know at the end of the day determine what uh, what happened so it's like we we the civil society academia have been distracted with this with this um you know technical issues you go deal with it you know while we we sit back and just watch you guys you know you know argue about the technicalities but at the end of the day we decide what we want to decide so i think it's very important that you know the political economy of things is, is uh, you know is well on the score and the, on the issue of um capacity you know i hear that a lot about you know the technical capacity of of revenue authorities but i, I think over the years we've we've had you know uh, significant growth in terms of uh, capacity particularly individual uh, uh, capacity but but does it really matter if the system is still the same whether or not you have capacity i i don't think it, it makes you know much difference because the system has been rigged so unless um uh, that the system is fixed, whether or not you have, no matter what capacity you have, there's no much you can do. So I think it's also important that you know we 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 look at things um, from this uh, perspective. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Martin. I had a question for Salma. Uh, what do you think a developing country like Kenya could do? Uh, kind of immediately to take a baby step away from the arms length principle, which would also practically, you know, help bring in some revenue. Okay, thanks. So let's just take the, let's just go to Salma and Marlene for a quick response there, which of those, those wants to reply and then we'll wind up this part. I think we may have lost Marlene. That was such a good question. <laughs> Salma, do you want to say anything in reply? Okay. Well, um, maybe they can think about it and let, let you know later. Um, uh, I was just thinking as Mustafa was talking, you know, there's that famous, famous IMF quote about how tax administration is tax policy. And surely we should turn it around a bit and say the technicality, tax technicality is tax politics. Um, I think that would be an, a nice way to end. OK, so I'm going to hand back to Abdul, our Master of Ceremonies now. Uh, thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And thanks to all the panelists and the audience for a, fasc for a fascinating uh, conversation. Um, we will now uh, turn to uh, the highlight of the event, which is to hear now from uh, Saul himself, uh, his reflections about um, 
uh, about what has been discussed so far and of course the context of the whole uh, event itself so over to you Saul. thank you very much abdul and i'm very very honored obviously i'm assuming you're hearing me yes yes we can hear you so loud and clear very honored by the occasion and grateful to everyone who's been involved for the efforts in organizing it i'm glad that it's uh, it's been uh, uh, an opportunity uh, to actually present some uh, very interesting papers from a variety of parts of the world uh, there's lots i could say but after after martin's comments about how ferocious my comments on people are i'll i'll hold myself back maybe uh, but i will send some comments to uh, some of the individual papers uh, and maybe respond a little bit but uh, what i want to say really is i, I just consider myself very lucky to just have lived this long uh, still feel relatively fit and have been able to continue uh, with an exciting life that I don't regard as work because nobody has paid me, um, which means I can do as I please. I'm also very lucky because since being formally retired, I've been able to use the understanding I got in academia to try and bridge what is often, I think, a wide gap between the very simplistic political level of public debate and the generally very recondite specialist uh, areas of knowledge uh, in this area of expertise I developed, uh, which became a hot political topic, taxation of multinationals. So I'll just give you a few reflections, trying to explain really how I got into all this um, and what my experience has been. Uh, broadly, what I've learned from life is you have to make the best decisions you can with the cards you are dealt. Uh, and in both respects, I've been very lucky. Um, I came to England as a, an immigrant at the age of five from a very different culture, the Middle East, uh, but in a family that valued education. My mother was a teacher. Uh, and that's perhaps why from an early age, I felt the need to try and understand the world and if possible, change it for the better. I think that's also why I chose to study law. When I was lucky enough to get a scholarship, that was at a time when you could get a scholarship to cover your maintenance costs and you didn't have to pay fees, which is unimaginable today. So I might have opted for sociology, uh, but actually it wasn't taught at the university I got into. Um, and since I was known to be an argumentative person and tended to challenge received opinion and the status quo, uh, maybe that's why I thought law was the right fit. Uh, also because I thought I needed to understand how power works if I wanted to challenge it. But when I got to start studying law, I found that it kind of concealed the realities of power. The formal rules of law uh, didn't seem to uh, uh, in any way directly uh, uh, show the way power worked. The more I learned the rules, in fact, the more I criticized them. Uh, I remember once during a seminar discussion, another student asked me why I was studying law if I was so critical of it. <clears throat> and then in my second year, uh, there was the annual dinner of the College Law Society, and that was an opportunity to meet up with alumni, and they tended to offer job possibilities. And since I was getting good marks, uh, I had invitations from top law firms back in Manchester, where I'd grown up, um, and even in London. But just it just seemed very boring to me to settle into a legal career so i preferred to try and learn more about the world I was again lucky to get a scholarship to go to university of chicago law school for a year now there i found that the law teaching was much more what they called realist uh, so it had more connection with the world uh, but it still seemed to reflect the status quo even though this was during a time of big political ferment um, i remember uh, when I got to New York, um, I went to an event mourning the victims of the recent Alabama church bombings by the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, and during the year I was in Chicago, President Kennedy uh, was assassinated. The law school, in fact, uh, had just not long moved into a wonderful uh, glass uh, uh, clad building by Ira Saarinen, famous architect, uh, but it was on the edge of the campus uh, 
really uh, in a black ghetto uh, in the south side of Chicago. And from my desk in the library, I could look down and see a kind of free prefabricated primary school with young children going into it in the morning. So the contrasts were stark. Uh, a classmate who'd spent the previous summer uh, supporting the Freedom Riders in the South took us on a very memorable road trip through the Deep South to New Orleans. Um, and uh, we could see that even then, uh, in the early 60s, uh, it was still scarred by segregation. So the contrasts, if you like, were very stark. Uh, but I was again lucky that my first job after Chicago took me to Doris Salaam in a un newly uni created university uh, in a period of uh, post-colonial upheaval. Uh, my colleagues in the law school were kind of had a similar background to me, although uh, uh, one who's my age, uh, who came the same week or so that I did, uh, was Aki Sawyer from Ghana. Uh, he'd been both to uh, Legon in Accra and uh, Durham. And we all of us tried to see find ways of teaching the law, which was mainly British derived, in a way that the students could try to relate it to the local context. But this was an uphill struggle, particularly for me, as I didn't know really very much about Africa. But again, I was lucky to get an opportunity. Um, <clears throat> there was a student demonstration, which had a sharp reaction from President Nyerere, uh, creating a crisis at the university. And in response, a group of us uh, put forward proposals that university courses should be redesigned for the post-colonial context. And uh, in the spirit of that, uh, I put up a proposal, which uh, my colleagues in law accepted, to introduce a first year course, which I called Social and Economic Problems of East Africa. Um, and this enabled me to coordinate it. I didn't teach it. Uh, I wanted to learn. Um, and I was able to bring in some uh, fantastic colleagues to uh, help us explore the colonial heritage and the current challenges facing uh, Tanzania and the rest of East Africa as a way of really helping us and the students uh, to ground their understanding of law. Uh, one of the lecturers, uh, particularly notably, uh, was Giovanni Arrighi, um, who some people may know as be became quite a well-known political economist and sociologist of the economy, uh, at that time, he'd recently been expelled by the white government of what was then Southern Rhodesia. Uh, uh, and uh, his work pointed to what he called the momentous implications of the increased domination of large multinational corporations, both for the development of capitalism as a whole and the process of underdevelopment uh, that was very clear in Africa. And this really struck home uh, to me. He gave an analysis for a number of ways. He seemed to me to be addressing the real world. Uh, but to do that, he had to combine politics, economics, and sociology. And this was very different from the standard kind of neoclassical economic abstract analysis, which uh, at that time, really, I think if you'd read a, a, a standard economics textbook on the international economy, multinational corporations wouldn't have been mentioned. Uh, they talked about international flows of capital uh, and international trade. And it seemed to me that that approach was upending uh, the formalist approach of neoclassical economics, just as I wanted to upend formalist legal approaches, because from a legal point of view, again, uh, multinationals aren't a legal entity. Uh, from a legal point of view, uh, it's the individual affiliates and subsidiaries that are the legal entities. Um, and law doesn't recognize multinational corporations as a legal person. <clears throat> and that became quite a big uh, debating point. So it's that kind of broad perspective uh, that has helped me to guide me in the subsequent work uh, when, when I've been generally teaching and researching on international economic and business law. At first, I didn't include taxation because I'd never studied tax in my degrees. But reading the regular... Uh, business news and professional journals I could see was important. So uh, in the mid-80s mid when I decided to uh, start planning a bigger book on uh, law and regulation of multinationals, I thought I should do a chapter about international attacks. Um, and that eventually became a whole book, um, finally published in 92. 
And in that, uh, I try to apply the approach. So I trace the historical development of the international tax system based on tax treaties, but how it was intertwined with the growth of multinational enterprises um, and internationalization of the state. And I'm glad that uh, uh, Veronica's picked up uh, uh, that aspect. Uh, <clears throat> unlike the standard tax books at the time, it actually analyzed the emergence of ta international tax avoidance, uh, tax havens, relationship of tax havens to offshore finance, um, and the responses uh, by the US in particular uh, with the control foreign corporations rules and so-called subpart F, uh, and then this 1968 detailed regulations on transfer pricing and how they'd worked out. Um, I went into the development of formal apportionment in US state taxation and the backlash by foreign multinationals, which were then at that time expanding into the US when they found that state taxes were being applied to their uh, global uh, profits, um, uh, that uh, led to this backlash, which led to a very high level political conflict. So I found that really fascinating, that combination of uh, intricate uh, technical legal detail, if you like, um, uh, but also the politics uh, with Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan apparently clashing in the G7. Um, so my book tried to both explain the legal details uh, and the broader context, uh, but I realised, and I said in the preface, that it probably had too much technical law for the non-specialists and probably too little for specialists. And I think that probably is true because uh, tax journals and tax academics largely, I think, neglected it, uh, although it did contribute to a growing interest amongst people in international political economy on the whole phenomenon of tax havens and offshore finance. And I got involved in that debate. So that was also soon after that the OECD adopted the transfer pricing guidelines of 1995. Uh, but that, as we all know, entrenched the arm's length principle. Um, and that, I could see, started fueling a fantastic growth of practitioners in international tax. I could see then already that uh, it quickly became a thing that practitioners wanted to get into. Um, and we subsequently found really what they were doing um, in reports uh, 10 or 15 years later. For example, the U.S. Senate uh, Permanent Subcommittee on Investigation reports. If you look closely at those, for example, the one on Caterpillar, it shows that it was at that time uh, that the uh, tax advisors, the big four and the others were systematically marketing um, <coughs> uh, structures for avoiding tax. Um, uh, uh, to the large multinationals. Uh, and again, now, looking back, we have uh, data to back that up. Uh, the uh, uh, recent EU, EU Tax Observatory's report um, <coughs> showed uh, that the losses from tax avoidance by multinationals zoomed up from around 2% uh, uh, of corporate tax revenues, they estimate, in 1995 to 5% in 2005 and 8.5% by 2015. Um, <clears throat> so it was uh, uh, interesting that the more the OECD put resources into trying to remedy the problem, the worse it got. And I think that was because um, of its investment in this so-called arm's length principle. Uh, but back in the 90s, uh, I think nas some national governments could see that this was beginning to cause problems, and the issue of offshore finance and tax havens did start to come into the public eye. Um, that led to the political initiative through the G7, uh, pushing the OECD, which then produced a significant report called uh, Harmful Tax Competition, although they soon uh, decided, or they were pushed by the Americans, uh, um, <clears throat> when there's a shift in the political leadership there to say how competition is good, so they called it harmful tax practices. But the that effort really then petered out, again, for largely for political reasons, into long drawn out negotiations to improve bilateral tax information agreements. Um, in the meantime, there was a multilateral mutual assistance convention, which I'd analyzed and discussed in my book, um, uh, in 1988, but it only had half a dozen states that had actually joined it. <clears throat> so it was in this period also that some non-governmental organizations 
particularly development oriented ones, I got interested. Um, and I was working with Oxfam on other issues at the time and pushed them and they uh, found the resources to develop a report, um, which uh, really I think was quite seminal, uh, the report on tax savers of 2000. Another person who was involved with them then was John Christensen. And he um, then, uh, <clears throat> through the World Social Forum, uh, started the Tax Justice Network. Uh, I joined it uh, quite quickly. <clears throat> and uh, that really was the start of the campaigning. And TJN was a campaigning organization, but it was from the start always very research led. Uh, we organized annual research conferences <clears throat> And the, really, the, I think the whole uh, uh, project was an idea whose time had come. The, it spread internationally. Uh, I was very glad to have been in Nairobi. I'm sorry I'm not there with you all now. Um, in 2007, uh, when uh, Tax Justice Network Africa uh, was founded. Um, <clears throat> uh, and eventually, obviously, we had the creation of the Global Alliance for Tax Justice, um, with Tax Justice Network taking a different role within the whole movement. <clears throat> so at the beginning, when TGEN was set up, the defects of the international system seemed pretty evident. Uh, the first manifesto of TGEN included uh, three objectives, and I quote, first, development of a comprehensive and automatic information exchange between all tax authorities. Secondly, audited accounts for all significant business entities and trusts, specifically disclosing turnover and tax paid with a breakdown for each entity and e in each territory or tax jurisdiction. That essentially is country by country reporting. And thirdly, taxation of transnational corporations on the unitary basis, allowing tax authorities to effectively re reverse the false shifting of profits to low tax jurisdictions. Those are, I think, our three main demands, uh, which at that time were re regarded as completely outlandish. But now, 20 years later, it seems a long time in a way, but in the wrong look, bigger scheme of history, I think is actually pretty quick. Uh, we see that two of them have really substantially been achieved. And the third, I think, is well underway. But it wasn't until the financial crash of 2008 and the fiscal crunch that followed uh, that really governments were uh, forced to take action. Um, for the rest of the 90s and 2000s rather, we uh, were pushing away these aims, uh, but really little action took place until after 2008. Um, and that again was through a politicization, first through the G7 and then the G20. They gave a political push to the OECD's technical experts. Um, <clears throat> They went so far as to, I think it was uh, David Cameron, the then British Prime Minister, who proclaimed the end of bank secrecy. Uh, so that put the technical specialist on the spot. Um, and that led to revamping the multilateral convention on mutual assistance, which had been really essentially dormant, um, and setting up a, a framework for comprehensive automatic exchange of information, which is what we'd been asked for. Although it's very notable, uh, that the US still hasn't joined the global framework, the uh, common reporting standard, and still only negotiates bilaterally and quite unequally uh, with other countries. Uh, then uh, in 2013, as we know, the, G the OECD in 2012 already started the project on base erosion and profit shifting, got political support from the G20. And in my view, the main achievement of that was the system of country by country reporting, which was our second demand. <clears throat> That's been going since 2016, although it's not yet public as we want. And although very, I think, uh, 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 shamefully, um, not very many developing countries are able to have been allowed to participate in the system yet. But still, I think it is a game changer because for the first time, it really shifts the attention of tax authorities. It enables them to focus on the allocation of the global profits of m and um, instead of this uh, really ridiculous focus on the arms length principle. Now, the final aim, unitary taxation, is a far more ambitious one uh, because it would entail overturning really deeply rooted conceptions uh, become very deeply entrenched in the thousands, hundreds of thousands, I think, of international tax practitioners, a high proportion of which has 
uh, I've said, uh, practice in transfer pricing. But we have made significant advances. Particularly in 2019, we found that it was the G24 developing countries who put forward proposals to the so-called inclusive framework on BEP for fractional apportionment. <clears throat> now, this wasn't immediately accepted at all, but it pointed the way forward. And in fact, after two more years, which I won't go into in detail, but we've mapped out in a, a paper, uh, <clears throat> we find that in the two pillar solution, the so-called solution, it now provides a basis for a paradigm shift to form the reportion unitary taxation. Amount A in pillar one actually adopts unitary taxation, but it only applies it to around 100 of the largest and most profitable multinationals, and only for a, sh a small share, a relatively small share, 25% uh, of their residual profits based on sales. Uh, but perhaps more important, in the multilateral convention for amount A, as well as the uh, uh, global minimum tax under pillar two, we have all the detailed technical standards needed to implement unitary taxation and form reapportionment. These include a threshold for taxable presence, simple and easy to apply, simply based on a minimum level of sales in the country. It also has sourcing rules to determine the source of sales revenues, which is quite important also, particularly in relation to services. Secondly, it has a definition of uh, tax adjusted global profit from multinationals. You can start from the consolidated financial accounts, but they're not suitable for tax purposes. And the amount A has uh, agreed a tax adjustments uh, to make them suitable. And then thirdly, it includes definitions and methods to quantify the three main factors usually used for form reapportionment. Um, <clears throat> to attribute profits based on the activities in each country, uh, spending on physical assets, the number of employees and their remuneration costs, and sales in the country. Now, you may ask, well, how did this come about? You might think that, you know, we, a few great minds just drew up a blueprint and we just went out there and persuaded people, uh, persuaded the policymakers purely from the force of argument. Uh, far from it. It was a long and sometimes painful process of critical engagement. And we worked from the inside out, if you like, <clears throat> uh, what uh, social theorists call imminent critique. Imminent critique, I think, means you engage seriously with the views of others, especially the dominant ideas. You have to patiently puzzle out the limitations and contradictions of what they're arguing, their ideas, uh, through debate and uh, constructive engagement. Now, you should be guided by some kind of goal for the direction of travel based on your understanding of what would work, what the real world looks like. But you have to test out its implications in practice yourself also, and in interaction with all kinds of people, including those holding different views. That's, I think, how really true insights come about. Uh, you need to be able to modify, develop and refine ideas. That's certainly been my experience. I, I'll just sketch out really how that process worked for us. Um, um, back in 2012, uh, Tax Justice Network had a seminar in Helsinki on transfer pricing. It was very well organized by David Spencer, who was then a senior advisor, had an impressive roster of specialists from many countries, including Brazil, China and India. Um, and that was really went into the issue of transfer pricing in depth. We didn't just denounce the arms length principle. We examined it very closely. Um, and really, the analysis of all these people showed it didn't work and we needed a new approach. And it should be based on treating multinationals in accordance with the what was the clear reality that they operate as unitary enterprises, although they're under common ownership and control. And that fitted everything I'd read about multinationals, uh, uh, which clearly generate uh, excess profits, high levels of profits, <clears throat> and that treating them as if they were simply a bunch of independent legal entities was just a fiction. Uh, they generate super profits due to size and synergy, 
so that the whole is much greater than the sum of its part. I mean, it's just a fantasy uh, to think that uh, these companies like Apple, Amazon uh, and Google or uh, Alphabet, as it's called, uh, really consist of a, a bunch of uh, independent uh, companies. Um, and in putting forward a proposal on unitary taxation, uh, I drew from the work of others, including Michael McIntyre, uh, who, had who had explained how the uh, US state system worked and the key role of worldwide combined report reporting and what the logic of formal reapportionment was. Uh, uh, but my main aim in the paper was to stress the principle, and I quote again from the paper, tax should be paid according to where the activities generating the income take place. So, to my surprise and pleasure, when the G20 supported the BEPS project, the St. Petersburg Declaration stated that the aim was M&E should be taxed where activities occur and value is created. So we very much enjoyed repeating that as a mantra in all our responses to uh, the pr proposals for the, uh, from the OECD under the BEPS project. Since the G20 gave them that aim, we could test their proposals against that objective. <clears throat> but it was clear that the action plan back in 2013 was completely contradictory. It, it kind of echoed that aim by saying that the aim was to align rights to tax with substantive activities, but it ruled out formulary apportionment, which seemed to us the only effective way to achieve that. The most that it conceded in the action plan was, again, quote, Special measures either within or beyond the arm's length principle may be required to address what they've called flaws. So that was only a very small step forward. And so it was clear that our job would be to really closely scrutinize the proposals developed under the action plan and test them against this stated aim of um, achieving alignment of tax with substance. Now we could see this would be a long haul so we thought we had to pool our resources, marshal our resources. So we formed this network called the BEPS Monitoring Group. Uh, some were a bit skeptical, uh, but the concept, I think, worked out pretty well. I was very happy to get uh, some former tax practitioners uh, since inside knowledge has been essential. Uh, I've been especially very grateful to Jeffrey Cadet, who early on contacted me. And we've had really very complimentary approaches. Uh, his close attention and knowledge of the detail and my big picture framing of the issues can be seen, I think, in all the VETS monitoring group report, uh, together with the contributions from really quite a lot of other people, including Atia, Abdul, um, <clears throat> others who are on this call, and I don't know if they're watching or listening, um, but we have to thank them all. It's really been a collective objective because I certainly could not anyway have done it uh, on my own, because the aim was to dissect and demystify the complexities of the technical proposals and draw out their policy implications as clearly as we could to facilitate a wider public debate. And it wasn't easy. We had to really work together to tackle. The, I mean, I'm glad Atiyah drew attention to this. The often stupefying complexity and opacity of the discussion drafts from the OECD and others. Um, and I certainly couldn't have done it. Uh, everyone, I think, experiences that if you just don't understand something, you kind of blame yourself for not being uh, somehow bright enough or clever enough. Um, so I was very relieved when even Jeff Cadet described one document, I think it was the OECD's model rules for the global minimum tax, as mind-bogglingly complex, um, <clears throat> which I think it was. And really, this really brought home to me, uh, or was the answer in a way to my original question of how does power work and how can we try and challenge it? <clears throat> International tax is far from the most complex problem facing humanity. Uh, expertise is essential to understand all of these and to try and devise appropriate solution. You do need expertise. Uh, because public discussion of these complex issues is all too often at a very simplistic level, especially now it's conducted through TikTok and Twitter uh, as much as anything. <clears throat> but on the other hand, too often the experts just become blinkered 
they don't see the real world because they're focusing on their very small part. So they can't contribute to that wider uh, and democratic debate. They have to focus on a specific issue that can be studied in depth. Uh, and they don't see beyond that. And they think what they identify uh, might be the whole answer. Uh, I think that's what I describe as technocracy. Um, and then, uh, I also very much agree uh, with what Mustafa said, because if the system is inappropriate, developing greater specialist expertise is, is not only pointless, it's actually counterproductive. Uh, all this capacity building uh, by the OECD and others in, in the arms length principle and in applying the arms length principle, it's just a waste of money if the arms length principle doesn't work, which I think is the experience actually of the OECD country. So that's, I think, the problem of uh, expertise as I've, I've uh, uh, come to understand it. Finding solutions that can work in the real world needs teams of people organized, often with different expertise. And they have to find ways to talk to each other to get a more holistic solution appropriate to the real world. <clears throat> but the capacity and resources to create those teams is what gives a lot of power. Because not only does that enable you to understand problems, but also devise the solutions you propose and to shape the public perception of what those solutions should be. And the problem, I think, in uh, our present day and age uh, is that these teams are too often dominated by private and sectional interests, particularly the giant global corporation. They spend billions on expert knowledge which they also fight to control and own. They pay the highest salaries. They generally get the best people. Even the best resourced governments are no match for the large corporations in their uh, spheres of uh, concern. <clears throat> and they can't provide enough resources to public institutions such as universities to provide truly independent expertise. People who work in universities don't have the space and time. And in any case, they're often pulled towards working for the corporate sector. So there are many ways in which expertise becomes closed off and privatized. And one of those is actually shrouding it in these esoteric practices, this excessive jargon and excessive complexity. So a wide public debate is essential if we're going to find both holistic solutions that can work in the real world and those that benefit the largest number of people and not those who control large multinational corporations. So I just consider myself lucky enough to have, lucky to have survived long enough to realize some of my ambitions. Uh, studying and teaching in universities enabled me to learn a lot and to try and communicate some of it, although academic life did have its frustrations. That kind of work takes a long time. It took me uh, a long time to finish the big book that I'd originally planned in the 1980s. I didn't finally finish it till two years after my formal retirement. But by that time, the earlier effort I put into the book on international business taxation had enabled me to use my remaining time and energy productively by combining theory and practice. So that's really been the st my story, if you like, uh, of the last 10 or 15 years. But I don't want to make it sound altruistic. It's been very rewarding and great fun. I certainly want to thank everyone I've worked with and been involved with for the comradeship and support, as well as apologizing to any who I might have disagreed with and rubbed up the wrong way. I've learned a lot from all of you. I hope we'll go on doing so together and that we can succeed together in a small way to make the world a better place. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saul. Uh, a big round of applause from uh, all of us, really. And I would say that uh, we are the lucky ones, actually, who can uh, benefit from your wisdom. And it's great that this is being recorded because this is something that uh, I hope that everyone from the tax justice movement listens to again to benefit from the perspective of not just someone who has witnessed history, but has uh, shaped it in, a, in, a, in quite a direct way. 
So uh, this event, as has been mentioned, has, is an event to honor a great man. And um, we wanted to conclude by also giving the audience an opportunity to share uh, to share anything which they would like to. And this would be, uh, take, and Mustafa will take us through uh, the concluding session. So over to you, Mustafa. Yeah, thank you very much, Abdul. Um, and thank you very much for, for everyone. So I'll, um, it's really an honor and, uh, you know, privilege you know, to, to, to be here, uh, to have this conversation and to, to chair this um, uh, session. Um, personally, I've been inspired by, by Saul and um, I've been privileged to, to work closely with him. Um, Saul has not spared, he, he didn't spare any opportunity, you know, to, to help me in, in my career uh, as, a tax, uh, as a tax expert. And I am eternally grateful uh, to you, um, Saul. Um, before I, um, you know, open up the, the floor for, for, for the audience and participants, I'd just like to say a few things that, a few things that I've learned, you know, from Saul. Um, I, I found that, you know, Saul is, is very firm uh, on ideology, um, yet uh, is very humble and very simple. <laughs> Um, because as as knowledgeable as and as experienced as Saul is, he's always also you know very willing to listen, you know, to other um, opinions. Um, secondly, um, as a as an early career researcher, I found Saul very highly analytical uh, in terms of his reviews, but yet very kind and uh, kind in the sense that, you know, I've I mean I've had. My my share of you know bad experience with, with with terrible reviewers you know as a as an early career researcher was one of the your worst nightmares is encountering a a very unkind uh, reviewer but uh, Saul has been very kind very patient and that really you know goes a long way uh, because for early career researchers one one terrible review can make you change your mind about you know the the entire career and um, Saul has been you know very very kind and you know personally to me and you know from and and also to to other of our colleagues and friends that are in the same uh space um and lastly um i think one thing we can all learn from from Saul from his years and decades of of work is you know Saul is very selfless um and um very very committed uh and i think um, if we have more people like Saul um in the in the space not just in the space in the, in the, in the world entirely the world would be it would definitely be a, a a better place and i i i truly feel blessed you know to be associated with you um so thank you thank you for being for being you um so yeah over to the participants and audience um you could easily raise your hand or make a comment we're not doing so well with time so we can um take a few yeah, let me see if we have any. I don't see any hands raised yet. So it doesn't have to be even the the panelists. If you have the panelists, can also you know say anything. I'm not seeing any hands raised yet. Yes, Veronica, please go ahead. No, yeah. Um, no, I, I, since this is in, in honor of uh, <clears throat> Professor Salpichota, I just wanted to also thank uh, Saul for his, I think it's always been generous contributions and, uh, and very important ones. I think in, in my case, uh, part of um, my, uh, my journey in life in relation to to international taxation uh, is uh, takes place actually at a moment when I I I I've met uh, a few very significant people uh, in my life and and one of them was definitely um, so Pichotto. Um, it's uh, another person also was Aristide Corti in Argentina who actually also allowed me to make this conceptual change of what I had experienced before. Um, but also uh, reading and, and, and recently finding out first uh, what I was studying uh, about these other connections and other um, ideas and uh, other 
line of work that uh, and which Saul had worked so much and uh, in the context of today's discussion was uh, enlightening uh, for me. So uh, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank Saul once again for for his generous contribution to uh, to academia internationally, but also uh, to in my personal uh, career and my life. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Veronica. I think we have um, some some words um, from Faith Amaru. And, uh, if, if I could just re uh, read that. Um, following a Cap Day meeting earlier this year, I've had the privilege of collaborating and, and learning directly from one of the most brilliant tax minds of our time. Professor Picciotto's intelligence, consistency, and analytical skills are just a few of his invaluable qualities that I greatly admire. I'm immensely grateful for this opportunity to learn from the best, and I'm excited to see what the future holds. Thank you, Faith. I still don't see any hands up. Um, oh, Tommaso. Yes. Please go ahead, Tommaso. Uh, Hi. If you're there, you yeah. Me? Okay, go ahead. Hi, you can hear me now. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the the was been said before and thank you so for the, the for the explanation of you and the uniqueness that you are and uh, I just want to say thank you for you know all the the leadership that you've given to the the tax justice movement over the years um you might not recollect but I think the first is a, probably the first time um I got I met somebody from the tax justice movement was you um and and the army did a conference in London that was uh in twenty fourteen I think um and uh that was you know the first encounter with somebody uh that uh me me myself coming from the corporate world um of uh, international taxation was uh you know was one of the moments where you kind of start thinking okay are you doing the right thing and what should be doing in life and uh, talking to you um help us help me make my decision clear to. To join uh, the tax justice movement and uh, then subsequently to to join ICRIT uh, and I've been have, have the privilege to have you to work with you and uh, not just ICRIT but also the BEPS monitoring group uh, and in other um, work and uh, you know I think you, you your contribution is uh, is is unique to the to the movement uh, and massive uh, and uh, you know it requires many. Many, many different contribution, many different types of contribution, and you've always been one fundamental and fundamental in a way also that has shaped what uh, a lot of the uh, tax justice movement has been demanding over the years, uh, particularly around unitary taxation and having the world talking about it. Uh, a lot is down to you. So, um, again, um, congratulations and hope that, uh, you know, you, as you said, you, you're still really fit. So, you're going to we expect you to be around for forever <laughs> um, and because we need you. So yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you again. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Tommaso. Um, I, I don't see any hands up. Um, so I, I think we can, because we're not doing so well with time, we think we can take two, maximum of three more, um, very short from anyone. Okay. Okay, Nikki, please go ahead. Hi, Sel. Well, I'm Sel's nephew. Um, just known that he's been a great activist. And I just want to say to all of you, it's absolutely wonderful from the family that you've given him this recognition. And listening to it all has been a great eye opener to Sel's work. So Thank you very, very much. Um, and well done, so Good on you. you got some great, great colleagues and students. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Okay. Um, 
I think um, I think that's it. And I'll hand over back to Abdul. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mustafa, and to the audience for those uh, warm comments. And we will now move to the vote of thanks. So over to Alex. Thanks, uh, Abdul. Um, and really, there's, there's a lot of thanks, but stick with me. Uh, I want to thank all the contributors today um, and also all the contributors to the journal, including, I think, Tatiana editorially, um, as well as, you know, everyone here who, who edited, um, and Priska, who, who did so much to actually make it all the work turn into a journal um, issue, which we are all really excited to see as soon as it's um, as soon as it's out. We've we've heard, I think, about the famous five, and you know their organisations. Also, ICTD hosting this this webinar, um, the African Centre for Tax and Governance, the Committee for Fiscal Studies, the South Centre, and um, especially I think Abdul, because Abdul, without your uh, leadership in this, I don't think we would have got here. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, but of course, uh, and perhaps above all, um, thank you to Sol. And there is so much to thank Sol for. We've heard a lot about your research uh, contributions um, already, and I, I want to recommend the whole journal. Um, please do do enjoy all the, the papers in that. Um, but I want to talk a bit more about the advocacy and campaigning um, that, that you've done, Sol. And it's a less common combination that research expertise and commitment to advocacy and campaigning, a less common combination than you might think. And it's a really valuable one. Um, and I think the Tax Justice Network, for whom we have the, the privilege of, of you being a senior advisor, probably know that um, better than anyone. Your insistence Sol, on research quality, as well as powerful communications, has been kind of such a significant influence on the Tax Justice Network and I think on the wider movement too that's developed over the last 20 plus years. Um, on unitary taxation, it hasn't just been the research uh, contributions you've made, it's been the way that you've pushed um, for that and you know eventually the, the adoption of that as the position of the Tax Justice Network and increasingly the, the movement that has been such a significant contributory factor to the, the fact that we're, we're able to talk about unitary taxation as a potential reality worldwide in a kind of five to 10 year period in a way that, you know, it, it, it was such a, an imaginary, such a utopian dream um, not so long ago. But we also want to kind of recognize some of the other contributions you've made. I think of your, your role, not least over a, a bottle of whiskey and a, a chicken and chips in Nairobi in bringing together the thinking that led to the financial secrecy index you know an index which challenges this idea that corruption is a problem of poor countries and kind of all the um the embedded racism that's in a lot of the the 2000s um discourse about corruption and instead puts the focus on the jurisdictions that drive corruption around the world by providing financial secrecy that drive illicit financial flows including but not limited to uh, corporate tax abuse um but equally, we can think of structural um, shifts that you've been involved in, so, um, you know, uh, jointly, um, I think, having the idea for ICRICT, solely having the idea for the BEPS uh, monitoring group. Some of the contributions there, not just the, the technical review of OECD proposals, but um, the positive uh, propositional work, like the, the meter, the minimum effective tax rate, um, the recent work published by the South Centre on unilateral measures that countries can take to defend their tax base because the OECD's two pillars are so demonstrably failing. But the thing that I want to focus on just a little bit um, uh, before I finish is, is not the research or the advocacy and campaigning, but the human uh, side. I think we've all seen today the kind of the multiplier effect of you as a human soul, not not just someone who, who guides research and encourages advocacy, but connects with people, students and researchers and others, all through your career. You know, I, we could have gone on for hours with with people, you know, talking about the ways in which they've they've experienced that and how it's helped them grow. In in many cases, really contributed to the the careers and lives that they that they have now. If I think back to the what the early mid two thousands, you know, there were barely a handful of researchers around the world with a focus on tax and development. 
and even fewer who you could say had any kind of genuinely progressive um, approach. And so I remember personally being really grateful to to meet you and and see that it wasn't just that you did interesting work, but that you were also, um, uh, you know, a human uh, exemplar of of how to how to treat people too. That said, and I think you've touched on this, you know, we we've had our few uh, arguments too, but that's part of being in a movement that cares about the outcome um, and having to work through the differences to get to to get to good places and that that challenging and testing of ideas is is kind of crucial. So we haven't always agreed, but I've always appreciated your your engagement so on. Um, so look for all the contributions that you've made and all the ones that are still to come. I thank you and and we thank you. Many congratulations on this special journal edition, um, really, and uh, I really, very deeply mean that. Lastly, um, thanks to everyone who's joined this event um, or are going to watch it later. Um, and I urge you to uh, to go and read the read the journal and also to read things like Sol's um, pivotal 1992 book on international business taxation, which you can find free in PDF uh, on taxjustice.net. Um, and with that, thanks to everyone um, and, and goodbye from me. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, Thank everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Thank you, Saul. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you.